Almost 3,000 years ago, King Solomon said, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Does that sound like America today? Credit card debt, for many in America, including many Christians, has locked them into virtual slavery. Credit cards in and of themselves are not good or bad. They're a tool that you can control for good, or they can control you when the debt becomes too overwhelming. Well, in today's message, our Bible teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, talks to us about a real slave who had run away from his master, but who found freedom as the Apostle Paul used his credit card to the slave's advantage. Dr. McGee titled his sermon, Charge It. So turn in your Bible to the little book of Philemon as we listen to the sermon. Now, Dr. McGee first gave this message during his pastorate at the Church of the Open Door in downtown Los Angeles, where he served for 21 years. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the freedom that you've given us through the work of your Son. Bless your word as it goes out. In Jesus' name, amen. The credit card has become the symbol of American business. It is the fraternity pin of the average American. It is a passport to plenty for a great many today. Anything can be bought today with a credit card, from a gallon of gas to a 10-gallon hat, from a sandwich to a chain of motels, from a night's lodging to a subdivision in Southern California. There is a restaurant in Texas that has up all of the insignia of the different credit card organizations. They say, we take diner's cards, we take the American Express, we take carte blanche, and then down underneath they say, we take cash also. When a purchase is made in any department store in the United States today, the classic cliché of the salesperson is, is this a charge or cash? There seems to be a slight look of disappointment if it's cash. You're immediately under suspicion of why you're carrying that stuff around. Even today, the income tax collector, whose features are otherwise as immobile as the Sphinx, he seems deeply moved if you paid for it with a credit card. And then and then only, is it deductible? It may come this morning to you as a bit of a shock to learn that Paul the Apostle had a credit card, even in his day, and they're not so new after all. When he wrote to Philemon, will you listen to him as he speaks? He says, If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. Uh, just use my credit card if you don't mind. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. So that Paul the apostle could write to Philemon and says, put it on my account, and I'm signing now my credit card so you will know that I intend to pay this. And back of that statement, of course, is a story. Back of the little missile of Philemon is a missionary. And back of this epistle is the apostle. Back of his promise is a person who will pay. Back of the charge is collateral. And back of the communication is a confidence that brings comfort to the heart. And I want us to see the background, first of all, of this little epistle, for it tells its own story. Paul went to Ephesus on his third missionary journey. He spent two whole years there, and we are told that the gospel sounded out from the school of Tyrannus during that period. And by that method, for it was a sounding board or actually a broadcasting station that sent it out to that entire area. And as a result, seven churches of Asia Minor came into existence, the seven churches that our Lord wrote to directly that you have in the first part of the book of Revelation. 
But there were other churches also that came into existence that Paul never saw, never visited them, and yet the people came in to Ephesus where he was preaching. They heard the gospel. They were converted. They went back to their communities, and a church, a local church, was organized. Such was the church of Colossae. It was a church that came into existence. And Paul never visited it as far as we know, and yet he's the founder of that church. Now in the church of Colossae, there was a very prominent man, and also he was a very rich man. His name was Philemon. Paul had led him to the Lord. Will you listen to Paul? I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self beside. Now, when this man was led to the Lord by Paul, it generally happens that when you are the instrument of leading someone to the Lord, they always feel indebted, and they are generally the ones that are the most generous, by the way. And I think that Philemon... When he came to know Christ, he came privately to the apostle Paul, and he said, Paul, if you ever have need of anything, or if ever I can do anything for you, you do not hesitate to call on me. You are the means of my new birth. You are God's instrument, and therefore I'm perfectly willing to do anything that is at all possible for me to do. Now Paul, in this epistle, is calling upon him to do something. And this is what it was. This man, Philemon, owned slaves, as practically every man of means in the Roman Empire did. Before Philemon was converted, and I have reason to believe it took place before, one of his slaves ran away was very common in that day, especially if a slave was mistreated. But sometimes, many times, they were not mistreated. We have no reason to believe that this slave had been mistreated. The name of this slave was Onesimus. And the very interesting thing is his name means profitable. And that uh, leads us to judge that he was profitable uh, to Philemon. Many slaves in that day were made custodians of the children of the owner. They were made custodians of the, uh, all of the estate. Many of them actually acted as a fiscal agent, and they could sign for the owner. The truth of the matter is some owners couldn't sign their names, whereas the slaves could. Many of them were educated. And so this man, Onesimus, evidently, Uh, profitable, had been very profitable, and as a result, he must have been put in charge of a great deal that, uh, that a slave would have under his supervision. He was a trusted slave, and of course, this opened up an avenue for him to escape. He could take advantage of it. He could reach into the till of his owner and take out that which he had needed for travel in that day. And the minute, though, that you say all of this, you reveal the open sower of the Roman Empire, that cancerous growth that finally sapped the strength of this mighty empire and brought it toppling down to the ground. Gibbon says one half of the population of Rome, of the Roman Empire, 120 millions of people in the Roman Empire, 60 millions of those people were slaves. The the slave was certainly not considered very valuable. One family in Rome had a retinue of 20,000 slaves, and slave owners in that day were incredibly brutal. They had no regard for the lives of those under them. May I say to you, the attitude of the Roman to the slave is the same attitude that the communist has today, the individual personal lives. 
The plight of the slaves in the Roman Empire was hopeless. No place for them to flee. They could not go beyond the boundaries of the Roman Empire. That was the most dangerous thing for them to attempt. For the minute they crossed over, they would be picked up. The only way that they could possibly effect a successful escape would go to some great metropolis and drown themselves in the great sea of the multitudes and the mobs that were there. And that, of course, made Rome uh, that type of a city uh, where they had to entertain them with circuses and give them free food because many of those people that were there were actually escaped slaves, but no one could put his finger on them. It would be difficult indeed to identify them. Now the slave, because of his hopeless condition and the way he was treated, he became morally corrupt. And in turn, he corrupted the youth of Rome because the slaves had the instruction of the youth of Rome and the gross immorality that came into the Roman Empire came in this way, the slaves teaching it to the young people of the Romans. Juvenal, the Roman writer, tells of a woman in Rome who had a slave killed just to see him die. This sadism that swept over the Roman Empire, these instances could be multiplied. The Emperor Augustus one time interfered with a citizen who was named Palio, who was about to throw a slave into a pool of voracious lampreys. And Augustus, uh, he uh, intervened. But don't think that Augustus loved slaves because the same Augustus Caesar, under whose reign the Lord Jesus was born, he had a slave crucified for the crime of killing a pet pigeon of his, that is, a pet pigeon and a favorite quail that he had. And the slave accidentally killed him. And as a result, why, he was crucified even as the Lord Jesus was. Varro, the, another Roman writer, says there were three classes of implements, of chattels in the Roman Empire. He divided them like this, vocal, semi-vocal, and dumb. Vocal were slaves, semi-vocal were animals, and dumb were plows and chariots and such like that they had around the place. When a slave stole, and many of them did, most of them were thieves, they, and they were caught, and I'm sure that would have applied to Onesimus, he would have branded on his forehead CF, the Roman or the Latin cave purum, beware the thief, and he carried that to his dying day. A runaway slave had no rights whatsoever before Roman justice, the master could take him and do with him what he pleased. Onesimus was a runaway slave. He belonged to Philemon. Onesimus finally made it to Rome. He didn't try for the border. He wasn't too far from it. But he didn't try for the border. He knew his only hope was to get into some great metropolis. And we have every reason to believe that he hopped from Ephesus, probably to Corinth, and then to Rome. And there he buried himself in that great metropolis with this great population around him, thinking he would never be discovered, and the chances are he never would have been discovered. But one day he was walking down the street. I do not think he was as happy with the freedom that he had as he thought he'd be. He certainly now had difficulty of uh, eating before his master fed him. He had difficulty now of getting a place to sleep before his master had that responsibility. And he found out that there was a freedom in slavery and there was also a slavery in freedom. And this man probably wasn't as happy as he could be. He's looking for entertainment, for Rome at this time was certainly looking for entertainment. And that explains the great Colosseum and all the entertainment that went on there. It was the emperors keeping the mob satisfied in order that they might not take to the streets and riot. And in that mob was Onesimus. 
Walking down the street, he saw a little group, a little knot of people gathered around some man, and he went up. He was curious. He elbowed his way into the crowd, and he had his first glimpse of Paul the Apostle. And this man was chained to a Roman soldier. In fact, the, that soldier who belonged to the Praetorian Guard, which meant he was a special prisoner. He'd appealed to Rome. But now he had freedom until his uh, time came up, that is, the freedom that the end of a chain would give to him. And he was chained to this soldier in his own hired house, and Paul was doing what he always did. God said to him when I called him, this man, I intend for him to appear before kings, and he's going to, and he has. And now he says he's to take the gospel to the Gentiles, and he is. And there he is preaching on the streets of Rome, and the crowd is around him. And Onesimus, he works his way up into the crowd, and he listens. And he hears this man talking about a liberty that's in Christ, a liberty that any slave would want, and a kind of a liberty that he had not found by running away always running, but this man who is chained to a soldier is free, and he's found out that if the Son make you free, you're free indeed, regardless of where you are or who you are. And this man, Paul the Apostle, is preaching about the crucifixion of Christ. He's preaching about his resurrection. He's telling men and women to believe on him, and some do. And Onesimus lingers after the others leave. And he said, I'd like to talk with you. And Paul led this man Onesimus to the Lord. He tells us that. He says, I beseech thee for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. While he's chained, that a Roman soldier, he led Onesimus, a runaway slave, to the Lord. And Onesimus said, I have to talk with you. I have something to say. And when everyone had left, this slave said to him, he said, you don't know who I am, but I'm a runaway slave. Paul said, where are you from? He said, I come from the city of Colossae. Paul says, there are many believers in Colossae, who is your master? He says, my master is Philemon. He says, you mean the Philemon that lives in Santa Monica? And he says, yes. Well, Paul says, I led him to the Lord in Ephesus several years ago, and he owes me everything. Onesimus says, well, then what must I do? Paul says, as a Christian, You've robbed your master, you've run away from him, and under this system, you'll have to return as a Christian. You'll have to go back to him. But he says, I happen to know this man, and I happen to know his heart now, and when you go back, you're going back differently than when you left. You left as a runaway slave. He was not a Christian, and you were not a Christian, but now you're both Christians, and it changes it. Paul said in this letter, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season. Isn't that a lovely way of expressing it? The fellow didn't leave for a season. He left for eternity. He didn't, never intended to go back. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldst receive him forever. Listen to this not now as a slave, but above a slave, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul now says to this man, when he was with you, you called him Onesimus. He was profitable, but he became unprofitable. Now that you do not have profitable, he is profitable to you, and he will be valuable to you when he comes back. Now this is the picture that is before us. 
And this is the story that's back of the story, the headline that is here. Now, Paul sent this letter with Onesimus back to Philemon, a quartet of men left Rome one evening. I don't think the Roman government recognized they were probably carrying the most valuable documents that ever left Rome. That was the epistle to the Ephesians, to Philippians, the Colossians, and the little epistle of Philemon. And Onesimus, the runaway slave, had this little epistle tucked somewhere in his garments. And he's on the way back to his master. Now, the question arises, what about slavery? Paul's not discussing here the right or the wrong of slavery. I'd like for you to see that this morning. I do hasten to say that the gospel, the coming of the Word of God, finally broke the back of slavery in this world. My beloved, everywhere this book is gone, it's ended slavery eventually. It takes men that are in the darkness of sin a long time, but it has always broken it. And where the Bible has been taken from the people, they go back into slavery. Look what's happening back of the Iron Curtain today. May I say to you, this is the book and the only book that's ever broken, the back of slavery. But Paul is not discussing here the moral issue at all. During the Civil War, the North used the little epistle of Philemon to show that slavery was wrong, and by the same token, the South used it to show that slavery was all right. And uh, who was right? Neither one was right, because this little epistle doesn't even discuss the right or wrong of slavery. He's not discussing the moral issue, and the question, of course, is why doesn't Paul discuss that? We're living in a day when people want to be pragmatic, and they say that we should grapple with these issues directly. I say no. Paul was preaching a gospel that alone could destroy the awful curse of slavery. And if he stirred up a revolt, it would cause an awful slaughter of slaves in the Roman Empire, for that happened time and again in Roman history, bears testimony to it. When in Rome, a few years after this, there was an outbreak led by one of the very capable ex-slaves and it led to the slaughter of thousands of individuals. Paul is preaching a gospel that will do two things. It will change man's heart, and then it will have a subsidiary effect upon society so that where this gospel is preached, and even though men will not accept it, it will cause certain institutions to disappear. The great revival of the Wesleys was, and Wesley never preached against slavery, never preached very much, by the way, against drunkenness. But I tell you, his preaching and the revival that came made England sober and delivered England from the revolution that came to France and it also ended slavery. It's the thing that moved in and broke the back of slavery. My beloved, may I say to you, men's hearts need to be changed today. We are hearing so much now of direct action. My friend, you may have direct action and force men to do certain things, but until their hearts are changed, you created a dangerous situation. We need today to have this gospel preached again in America as it was preached years ago during the days of Affini and the days of a Moody. And if it were preached, it would solve 90% of our problems that we have today in this country as a nation. We're going at the problem from the wrong direction today. It would solve many of our problems. Paul went at it from the right direction. He knew that his gospel would sooner or later break the back of slavery, for no longer can Philemon treat Onesimus as a slave. 
He says he's your brother. And when a man's your brother, you can't make him your slave. What a transformation is taking place and has taken place in this picture and in the home of Philemon. Now, I want to come to the epistle very briefly. When I read the epistle of Philemon, I feel that I'm reading a personal letter that was not intended for public gaze. I'm confident that when Paul wrote this little epistle, that he did not recognize here that the Spirit of God was going to use this in the Word of God. Now, he knew it when he wrote Romans. He knew it when he wrote 1 Corinthians. He knew it when he wrote Ephesians. But when Paul wrote Philemon, he's just opening up his heart and being very personal. And I feel like I'm reading somebody's personal mail when I read Philemon. And it always is a little embarrassing to read somebody else's mail. The first year I was in college, they put the freshmen, all of us with an upperclassman, and I was put with one that I was glad to move out after the first semester. But I found him one day reading my personal mail. And in order to get even, I began to read his mail. And uh, I want to say that I quit, and the reason I quit, I never had such a guilty feeling of reading somebody else's mail. I have that feeling when I read Philemon. Because Paul here, he opens up his heart in a quite an unusual way. He says, I'm sending Onesimus back to you. He's a trained man, and Onesimus evidently was that. Apparently had a real gift, probably of handling matters. And Paul's now in prison. He's tied to a, a, Roman, a Roman soldier, and he can't navigate about. And there are many things he'd like to have done. And when Onesimus was saved, he thought, why wouldn't it be wonderful to have this fellow here with me to be, sort of be my assistant and and to run on errands and to do things for me. What a wonderful thing it would be. And he, and he thought along that line. Fact of the matter is, he was almost on the verge of doing it. But then he said, no, I can't do that. <laughs> that wouldn't be honorable. I, I must send him back. And listen to him when he wrote that. He says, uh, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is mine own bowels, and don't be afraid of that expression. After all, TV's pretty plain today. Uh, what he's talking about here is that which is psychological, and they know it today. You know, they found out now that there are actually two places where you and I live and move and have our being, up here, and not much happens up here. You probably have discovered that. But honestly, we live and move and have our being down here. And Paul is saying here, he uses the expression three times, he says, you receive him just like you'd receive my heart. Just as that would be the expression we would use. Just as you would receive my heart, I want you to receive this man just like that. Now, will you listen to what he says here? He says, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him. That is, receive my heart. When you receive Onesimus, you're not receiving a runaway slave that deserves to be crucified and have the brand put upon him, CF. No, you're receiving the heart of the Apostle Paul. And that's the way I want you to treat him. Now listen to Paul. Whom I would have retained with me that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. Believe me, Paul is really opening up, isn't he? He says, I, uh, I thought about retaining him, that in your stead, because you said you'd do anything for me, that in your stead he might minister unto me in the bonds of the gospel since I'm in prison, but... I thought it over and the Christian thing to do, but without thy mind would I do nothing that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. If I sent the letter back without Onesimus, you might say, yes, that's all right, but Paul put me on the spot. 
And I have to do it because he forced me to do it. Keeping. Paul says, I'm sending him back to you, and if you want to send him back to me, that's all right. I do not know this. We have no other word. But I think on the return boat to Rome, Onesimus was on the boat coming back to minister to the apostle Paul. I think that would have been the mind of Philemon at this particular time. Now I come on down into this epistle, and this is, if you'll notice here, he's talking about something that's quite wonderful. Not now as a servant, not now as a slave, for that's the word, but above a slave, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul, back in verse 11, played on those two words, anesimus and not anesimus, profitable and unprofitable. He says, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. It's interesting that when the man became a Christian, he, he became profitable. He became valuable. He wasn't before. What a value to become a child of God. What a value it puts upon a man. What a different man it makes him, if you please. Now he says here, not now as a slave, but he's a brother to you now. The minute that a man comes to Jesus Christ, and accepts him as Savior, he's brought into the body of believers. And in that body of believers, Paul, when he wrote the Galatians, says something wonderful takes place. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. You're not now Philemon the owner. And you're not Onesimus now the slave, neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. A new relationship now has been established between Philemon and Onesimus. A new relationship. And how could it be established? I want you to notice this. For actually, this is the only and the real integration that the Word of God knows about. And this is an integration when two men, this has nothing to do with color, it has nothing to do with race, it has nothing to do even with the sexes, but it has everything to do with a man coming to Christ. If a man has not come to the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior, he's not a child of God. The most damnable heresy in the world today is this universal fatherhood of God and universal brotherhood of man. The Bible knows nothing about it. Our Lord even said to the religious rulers, Ye are of your father, the devil. The one brotherhood that the Word of God knows about is that brotherhood that's in Christ today. Where a Jew and a Gentile, where a, a free man and a slave, a rich man and a poor man, male and female, they come to Christ and they are brought into a brotherhood where they are made one in Christ, my beloved. That's the brotherhood that the Word of God know something about it, and it's a real one. It absolutely revolutionized the home of Philemon. It revolutionized his business relations. It revolutionized his relationship to this man, Onesimus, a runaway slave. Why? Well, you notice what he says now. Listen to this. If thou count me therefore a partner... Receive him as myself. Philemon, you always said to me, Paul, I hope in your busy ministry you'll be able to come to Colossae someday. I have a lovely palatial home, and I have a guest room, and I want you to come and visit me. And when you come and visit me, I'm going to put you in that guest room. Paul says, if I can ever find time, I'll be glad to come over and visit you. But he never found time. He never visited Colossae. But he says, Onesimus is coming home. You're not going to crucify him. You're not going to beat him. You're not going to mistreat him. 
I want you to receive him just as you would receive me, Paul the Apostle. That's not all. If he hath wronged thee, and he had, or oweth thee aught, and he surely did, Paul says, put that on mine account, charge it. Here's my credit card. Put it on my credit card. Onesimus can't pay. Charge it to me. I will repay. This scene now sinks into the shimmering shadows of the past. This incident that concerned the apostle Paul and two believers in the early church, it now fades into the halls of history. And I see another scene, a present-day scene, one that's being enacted right today, has been reenacted in my life and has been reenacted in your life if you're a child of God today. I see the throne of God and I see the Lord Jesus Christ sitting at his right hand and I see a fellow that was a sinner by the name of Vernon McGee coming to God for forgiveness. The Word of God told me I was a slave of sin and that I was a runaway slave because I was in rebellion against God. And I came to him. I had wronged him. I was a sinner. I was lost. And a holy God couldn't receive me. A son who came down here 1,900 years ago and died on the cross turned to the Father and said, If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee off, put that on my account. I paid it 1,900 years ago when I died on the cross. I paid the price. I paid the price. If he, if he owes you anything, if he's wronged you, if he's a sinner, put it on my account. I pay it. And Jesus paid it all. He's the one that has the credit card today. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, and he's the one who washed it all away. That's not all. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If you count me a partner, and he is, the Lord Jesus is equal with the Father. The Father and the Son are one. And they have one mind. And the Son says, I want you, I want you to receive him. Just as you receive me, my friend, this morning, and I'm being reverent now when I say this, this morning you have as much right in heaven as Jesus Christ has or you have no right there at all. You are either completely, perfectly saved in him. The son said to the father, I want you to receive Vernon McGee just like you receive me. And that's the way he receives you. Accepted in the beloved. My friend, you can't be saved any more than you are this morning. If you're in Christ, that's 100% being saved. And you don't add to 100%. A million years from today, you're going to find that I'm going to be much improved. I hope so. But I won't be any more saved a million years from today than I am this morning. In Christ. In Christ, 
There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Are you in him this morning? The Son is at the Father's right hand this morning. And it doesn't make any difference who you are. You can't be any worse than Anasima. If you come, he says to the Father, you receive him. I paid the price. I paid the price for him. If he's a sinner, and he is, if he's away from you, and he is, if he'll come, I paid the price. I'll pay it all. And I want you to receive him just like you receive me. And God today is prepared to receive you. He will receive you. He wants to receive you. He loves you today. Because the Lord Jesus came down here and he paid the penalty for all your sins. And they're all been put on him if you'll come to him. If you come, he says, I paid it. Put it all on my account. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The question is, are you in him today? If not, then you need to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior because he paid the price for you. He paid it all. And when you receive him, Christ will say to the Father, I want you to receive him just like you receive me. God's prepared to accept you today. So we hope that you'll receive Christ and make that transaction complete. For more information on God's plan of salvation, call us right now at 1-800-65-BIBLE and leave a voicemail request for the salvation packet. And when you call, be sure to include your name, address, and the call letters of the station. Today's sermon was called Charge It. You can hear it again online at ttb.org, or it's also available on an individual CD. This sermon can be downloaded for free as a PDF booklet from our website at ttb.org. For ordering information for the CD, contact one of our service operators at 1-800-652-4253, Monday through Thursday from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific Time. Although we've already finished Dr. McGee's study in the book of Philemon on the Through the Bible radio program, it's never too late to join us on our five-year journey through the Word of God. This week, we'll be in the amazing apocalyptic book of Daniel. If you'd like to follow along with Dr. McGee's daily program and really study the meaning and application of this book, then you'll want to be added to our mailing list for notes and outlines. To do so, contact us by calling 1-800-65-BIBLE anytime, using our internet order form, or downloading them from our website at ttb.org. Or write to Sunday Sermon. For those in the U.S., Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325. London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. This is Steve Schwetz for the Through the Bible Radio Network with a prayer that God will fill you with His grace, mercy, and peace. Jesus made it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, be washed in white as snow. This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of Through the Bible Radio Network.